This conference will now be recorded. Okay. We'll start our meeting. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, next on our bill. Consider the uh, is there a motion to approve the manager? So moved, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, could you just remind everyone to mute their phone when they're not talking? I think I'll second that motion by Patrick. Okay, all those in favor of uh, Mr. Bernie's motion to approve the consent agenda, please signify by saying aye. 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 Stands voting unanimously. Since there were no items removed from the consent agenda, uh, we'll move on to the director's report. Uh, is there a motion to approve, Sam? So moved. Second. Okay. Uh, gentlemen, any questions, comments with regard to the director's report? Uh, Mr. Chairman, just if I could have uh, just the two general managers walk through the uh, personnel components of their respective reports to the director, just so we understand where we are currently on personnel issues with all three divisions. Sounds reasonable to me. Uh Tony or Neil, I don't care which one of you would like to start it, but uh, uh, Neil, since I see you, I'll ask you to start. Certainly, let me, it was a week and a half ago I wrote it, so a lot is changing, so let me um, just refresh. Okay, so I'll start with the water division. And, Show of hands, is my, is my speaker okay right now? Yeah, okay, you're, thank you. you're good. Perfect. Um, so currently um, we are in the recruitment for a maintainer two position in the water division. This was specifically for the distribution crew. Uh, this was a vacancy created by Frank Winters when he was promoted uh, to chief maintainer. Uh, so we did complete interviews last week, and uh, we do expect to make an appointment within uh, the next five to ten business days on that position. Um, the other item, which I think we've alluded to before, is uh, Brian Naples began with uh, the Water and Sewer Division as the business manager uh, December 14th. Uh, because he was promoted from the assistant business manager uh, in the electric division over to the water and sewer divisions. There is now a vacancy. So uh, we jokingly refer to it as the joint custody arrangement. Uh, Brian is graciously working in the mornings at the electric division, taking a well-deserved lunch, and then he is with the water and sewer divisions in the afternoon. Um, so he is very busy because he is basically the lead person for all three division budget this year. So if he's not feeling overwhelmed tonight, uh, give him a couple more days and he will be there. Uh, so those are, those are current active recruitments. Um, elsewhere on the personnel, uh, we do have a senior operator at the Pistapog Water Treatment Plant. Uh, we are not posting for that because there really aren't a lot of people with certifications out there. We know them. So why spend the advertising dollars? And then the other position we do have open right now is a maintainer two position in the distribution crew. And once again, we're trying to fill one before we decide uh, where to go with um, that position. So any questions on the water side? Uh, uh, Neil, it's Patrick. Just, yeah, just, um... I, we have talked 
talked about this previously, but we haven't talked about it in a while, that the Pistapog Pond crew, and it, it, we were running on with a lighter crew out there, weren't we? Um, and can you just provide a, an update or status on um, Pistapog? Certainly. So uh, previously, let's go back to basically when I started in 2016 through mid to late 2018, we were running two formal shifts. We had a first shift from 8 uh, to 4.30, and then we had a second shift, uh, which was a hard 8 from 3.30 p.m. to 11.30 p.m. Uh, because of staffing, uh, we have moved that to uh, we shift into some of our uh, laboratory testing around, and so now, right now, uh, we are primarily running a uh, first shift from 8 a.m. to 4.30 p.m. with a full complement of our staff. Uh, we do have two recent retirees uh, filling in for four nights of the week in evening shifts. So we're basically at a single um, shift right now at Pistapog, and that's because we just don't have enough bodies. And so you're not looking to fill any spots, and, and are you comfortable with the, the staffing model that, that you're utilizing up there now? I think the staffing model we're comfortable with is a function of um, they're just are not the certified operators out there. And so Pistapog was designed to be staffed by eight senior operators. Um, right now, we have two senior operators and four junior operators, as well as two senior part-time staffers. So we're making it work, um, but we really would like another full-time senior staffer we would like seven full-time individuals because we're perfectly staffed when we're full, but that doesn't account for vacation, sick, other reasons, so staff staff is out. And so Pistapog, you know, we have staff on, on the plant seven days a week. So they're both inside the plant as well as what we call rounds. So every day we visit all the pump stations, all the water storage tanks, the pressure reducing valves, you know, in our distribution system. I noted the uh, issue on the consent agenda re regarding the, the, the appropriate, uh, what I'll call the budget appropriation for uh, um, Bill. What is your expected time frames? to have Brian up and running um, and not need the services of Bill. I guess stated differently, what is that budget, what is that budget number gonna get us to? What date in your mind? Um, so to answer your first question, really uh, when it's a function as to when the electric division uh, brings on a business manager as well as an assistant business manager. Um, so we're a little bit the water and sewer divisions are tied to them. Um, this financing that we requested this evening, which was approved in the consent order, uh, is the goal is to bring us through um, at least the mayoral meeting as far as the budget process goes. So uh, Mr. Phelan has the experience, but at this point, we also need the horsepower as well. It just all can't be done with 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 Brian. But to Bill is working um, about 40, the goal is about four to eight hours per week uh, for the water and sewer divisions. And that our, we project that will bring us out to about mid-March. Okay, so uh, in, in a lot of ways, uh, we are tied to the hip with the electric division in terms of filling Tom's spot. Well, it's Tom's spot as well as Brian's vacancy because he was assistant business manager. Sure. So, wow. Yeah. <laughs> I, couldn't, I couldn't be like, hey, yeah, he's ours now. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, thank you, Neil. Um, and I guess we, we can move over to electric now, unless 
if someone has any so follow-up questions on that. You want to do sewer? Yo, please, please. Yes, sewer, important. Yes, I apologize. So um, let's start with the maintenance repair technicians. So the maintenance repair technicians are, they take care of all the sewer pump stations. They take care of all the large pumps at the wastewater treatment plant. And they also take care of the garage, which includes 130 <coughs> fleet vehicles between all three divisions. So Tom Doyle was promoted in late December from MRT1 to MRT2. So we currently have a vacancy uh, for maintenance repair technician at uh, Tom's old position. And in late December, uh, we brought on two laborers, uh, Mr. Scott Olson and Mr. Jason Moda. And the reason we did this is very similar to what we did up at Pistapoc. We weren't finding the attendance with the wastewater certification. So we converted temporarily one attendant one and one attendant two. To uh, laborers um, with the goal that uh, these two gentlemen will grow with the sewer division and get their certification. And in addition to that, uh, we did have an attendant one leave us in early December. Do we have a vacancy there? So right now the active recruitments are MRT one and attended one. And then a you know, prelude um, in the facility plan, I will point this out. Uh, in the facility plan, it does recommend that we will need one additional staffer to uh, operate all the new equipment in addition to our current staff. So we will be looking to bring on a maintenance repair technician two uh, beginning uh, budgeted for July 1 of this year. We're going to put it in the budget and see where it goes. Um, you know, we've got new secondary pump station. We've got new UV equipment. We've got all the pumps as far as the tertiary phosphorus building. So you will see that included in the budget as well. So that's where we stand with sewer. Okay. If there's nothing else on water sewer, then uh, Tony, if you would uh, bring us up to date on the electric uh, personnel, please. Sure. Um, can you all hear me okay? I can. Okay, excellent. Um, uh, so for electric, uh, you know, the internal candidates for meter apprentice, uh, that position, we had a vacancy there that was created by uh, somebody going over to the uh, line apprentice group. Um, that position has been filled and uh, the candidate started today. Um, the chief engineer position, uh, this position is a, it's the a second time we've posted it. Uh, HR did conduct their interviews last week and I received a list um, from them of qualified candidates. There is um, one individual um, on the list, which we will be interviewing uh, in the in the next week or so. Um, we'll be scheduling that interview. Um, Chief Meter Man, uh, you can see that uh, we we posted that a few times. Uh, second time around, um, you know, we, we basically it was an internal candidate uh, which was promoted into that position, and which created a vacancy for the meter apprentice. And once again, we've posted for both. Um, I posted in parallel a meter apprentice and a qualified meter man. Um, you know, we have one vacancy, but if, if I do receive somebody that's fully qualified, uh, I, I, would, I would prefer to get a qualified person in there. If not, I can always go to the apprentice list and, and interview candidates uh, for an apprentice there. Um, Energy conservation specialist. Uh, it's my understanding that those um, interviews occurred last week with HR. I'm I'm waiting on a list from HR. I'm expecting that that any day now. But I was told that uh, they were scheduled for last week. Um, the next position is the <clears throat> the system operator position. Um, right now uh, we have uh, a, one vacancy. Um, to fill there, um, but I have a gentleman that is leaving February 1st. 
Um, I have another gentleman in that group that can leave any day, and uh, that would leave me with three qualified operators. That group is a typically when fully staffed is a five man rotation. Um, knowing that we had uh, three uh, employees in that organization that, that could leave it any day now, a few years ago that was staffed up to six to try to start, you know, getting people in and qualified um, in order to be in a, in a good position. And uh, we're a little behind there. I, I'd, I'd like to get some, you know, some folks in there and trained, um, but that's, that's being worked on. Um, Rick and I met with uh, the HR director and came up with a potential solution um, that we're that we're working on right now to get like a uh, a trainee position um, for that for that group, um, which would allow us to bring in somebody um, and get them trained to be fully qualified, you know, at a lower level and and provide the training uh, necessary for that group. Uh, business office manager position that uh, posting has come down, and I believe HR conducted the oral panel last week as well. And uh, I'm waiting to get a list from them on that. Um, I did confirm that those those uh, interviews did happen up there. Um, the authorization for employment for the assistant office manager, the the vacancy was created by Brian Naples. That position has been posted, and I have yet to get a schedule from HR on when they're going to conduct the oral panel for that position. Um, it, there could be a possibility that, that they're waiting for that position, the office manager position, to be filled before conducting those interviews, but I'm not certain. Um, the authorization for employment for meter reader that has been posted. Uh, the um, we did get a candidate list uh, sent to us by HR, and we scheduled, there was 12 candidates uh, to interview. Uh, one of them dropped out um, because they they uh, moved on to other, uh, you know, other offers, and we interviewed and completed all 11 interviews last Friday. So we just need to select our preferred candidate and make an offer there. And that will fully staff the, the meter reading uh, group at this point. Um, the apprentice meter technician, like I mentioned uh, above, when we uh, promoted Stan Dosky from chief meter technician to, uh, I'm sorry, to chief meter technician from meter man A, um, we created a vacancy there, which has been posted. Um, and then the authorization for a distribution technician um, has been posted. Um, and that I do not believe has come down yet. Uh, it should come down soon. And then uh, HR will have to schedule and conduct their interviews. And that was as a result of Joe Dwyer uh, being promoted to general line foreman. So. Uh, uh, thank you, Tony. On the, on the issue, I guess two follow-up questions for you um, based on your experience. I, this is the first time I'm I'm learning about this concept that, that there actually are interviews of candidates before they actually ever get to you. Um, what is the timing? Based on Neil's report, what do you think the timing is on filling Tom's spot and backfilling Brian's spot? Tom's spot, if I get the list this week, we can begin scheduling interviews, you know, interview within, you know, the next week or so. Um, we select our candidate after they're interviewed, and then depending on if they're internal or external, I mean, there's um, you know there's a conditional offer process where a conditional offer is made, and uh, you know it's subject to uh, background, you know, criminal and motor vehicle background checks, um, and then a drug screening and uh, physical exam. So that that all could take, you know a month after we're done and the conditional offer is 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 issued you know to get through that process can take you know two to two to four weeks um and then once that happens we contact the, the candidate we schedule a start date typically if they're leaving somewhere they they want to you know give a minimum of two weeks and then uh so you know right now as we sit here today it could be six 
plus weeks out for Tom's job and Brian's job. I don't even know if they started their process to schedule the oral panel and interview yet. Boy, that just sounds like a, a, a long time, a long, long time, um, which is concerning to me. The issue of the uh, system operators, um, this apprentice system, this apprentice process, is that already underway? And, uh, you know, I, I guess the other question is, when do you when do you foresee you being at full employment in the sister system operator uh, category? But you have so, the, I, I know there's all, these are all critical roles, not having meter meter, not having meter meters, reader, meter technicians is a critical role. But the system operator one also just seems alarming to me. Right. So that one, um, it, it is underway. We, we, I have a draft um, put together of what that would look like. Um, that'll need to go, you know, that's got to be something that it goes through human resources. It goes through the union, um, you know, for approval and then and then uh, on to uh, town council. Um, so that, that, you know, it could be as early as you know the next town council meeting if if all goes well through through um hr and 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 the union um and then as far as filling that role i mean it it typically takes uh our experience is it takes about six months to get somebody qualified so there's a difference between filling the you know having the body here and then having the body qualified um, on the desk. So, um, you know, if we go through the process and let's say we get somebody here two months from now, they won't be ready for eight months. So, you know, right now I have one person leaving in February and then mid-February I'll have somebody you know, qualified in that organization that's going through the training process. And that'll bring me to four operators, um, which is, uh, which is, is okay. Um, however, if, if the one individual that's in there decides to retire, um, you know, it's going to put them down to a three man rotation, which, which would be basically seven days a week, uh, you know, eight hour, eight hour shifts, um, no breaks. For, uh, that's, that's three people running a 24 seven operation. And Correct. that doesn't even account for COVID. If something were to happen, unfortunately, on, in the COVID front. Cor Correct. Okay. Again, that's a critical. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Okay, uh, any other comments or questions with regard to the director's report, gentlemen? Okay, there is one comment I would like to make, uh, and that is with regard, that is with regard to uh, page 4-21. And, <clears throat> This is with respect to addressing the internal you know, monitoring control regarding behind the meter generation. And I had asked Rick a question on this as sort of a follow-up, uh, and that was with respect to would there be, does it appear that there would be any sort of reach back on this if they do this? Uh, thinking of um, 50 and 5, et cetera. Uh, and Rick, if you want to make some comments with regard to that, please, I'd appreciate it. Uh, I know what the answer is, but I would like the other two commissioners to hear that, please. Rick? Can you hear me now? Mr. Chair, just so you know, we, we can hear you. Okay, I, I assume that. Okay. To answer, I, I can answer my own question very honestly because of the fact that Rick did check with, with uh, and 
and it appears that this is strictly on, going to be on a going forward basis. It's strictly for installations that are under five megawatt. Um, so I don't think it should have any, there does not appear to be any potential concern for us in any way, shape or form. But I, that, that was one of the things that I just, you know, that just stuck out to me. And that's based on, in part, in large part of my experience over the past 15 or so years here. So I just wanted to mention that in passing. Uh, if there's nothing else, uh, I Well, will... you know, uh, Mr. Chair, uh, it, since you raised that issue, just, that was in, in or around the report uh, that the, uh, the Pierce operated at a loss in November. And uh, I don't know if you had any thoughts on how is that is the the potential Pierce loss something that we're going to see in the foreseeable future because of the decrease in capacity costs? Uh, yes, I believe I'm unmuted now. And that can you folks hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, earlier my phone indicated I was unmuted, but I don't think Go to Meeting had unmuted me. So, um, yes, we. I believe we reported a commission some time ago uh, and shared a projection that Mr. Keeney had prepared that, um, yes, the Pierce project, because of largely because of lower capacity revenues, will run in the red for the foreseeable future. And I think you'll recall that at the time the discussion was, should we give notice or not? And the law department had advised that it's not necessary. The wording in the contract is such that we actually have to give notice to remain in beyond the end of calendar 21. We're going to take through you, Mr. Chair. Um, I, I think I uh, 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 follow where Patrick's coming from, and, and my notes uh, are, are fairly similar. And that is the uh, uh, the Pierce facility was not dispatched. It wasn't dispatched because of economic reasons. It's got a high bidding requirements. It wasn't able to reach bidding um, uh, the low bids that are coming in, and uh, it would appear. Uh, based on some of the new generation that's coming online from some of the solar facilities and potentially other facilities, uh, prices will remain low uh, in the Pierce facility will be challenged to achieve successful uh, 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 bid acceptance. So well, that's, if you're concerned- That's true. Uh, this is Rick. Um, of, of note is it's it's not an energy resource. It never has been. Right. And so it it's never been competitive as a energy resource. That's why on a monthly basis, it's rarely dispatched other than for its own necessary test runs. It's its prime source of revenue is its mere existence through capacity revenues. And those have softened and look to continue, right. at least in the short term. Yeah, I would agree with that, Rick. I, I think it's, uh, I, I don't see a reversal of that trend, at least for the short, at least for the short and, and midterm future. So, Mr. Was... Chairman, go, go ahead, ahead, Mr. Chairman, sorry. No, I'm just go saying, ahead. so I think this is something that we probably should continue to talk about um, as we get into the through the first and second quarter of 2021. Uh, agreed. I just made a note to myself. I will ask Mr. Keeney to refresh his his projections. No. Patrick, I couldn't agree more. Um, and based on the uh, capacity payments that we know, you know, based on the auctions that we have that we're looking at for the future, you know, the prices there are just going down, down. Uh, what's going to happen with this with this one that's coming up the first first of February? Is anybody's guess? I think it may be it's possible. It may be a little better, but I don't think by much. Uh, but one of the things that's really kicking this one is, if I read this correctly, is the for is the forward reserve portion of it has hurt us too, and that will last until I believe May first or through May, and you know, in any event. Uh, 
But it's a very real issue. I, I, I couldn't agree more. We need to we need to keep on top of it. Be aware of where it's going. Get a, get it updated by Craig, uh, so we have an idea of where it's going for the next several years. So we can make an appropriate decision before 12:31, uh, 21. All right. Is there anything else uh, with regard to the director's report? Hearing none. All those in favor of approving the director's report, you know, have a saying aye. 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 Stands voted unanimously. Uh, with that in mind, then I'll open up the uh, public question and answer period. Are there any questions from the public? Yes. Uh, that would be Adelheid, I do believe. Yes, ma'am. You go right Yes, ahead. correct. Adelheid Cope 35 Whistletree Road. Um, good evening. I have uh, just a quick question, suggestion, maybe hearing about all the open positions, including um, laborers, apprentices. I was wondering um, if if you have ever thought about cooperating maybe with a school district. I think the manufacturing pipeline that the school district, the district was running with um, Hopcap was very successful and is, I think, going in a third round. I was just wondering if that, that might be some program that could be beneficial to the electric or water sewer division as well. Um, and then I have another question going back to the December, uh, what was it, I think 15th meeting. Um, the agenda item 14 discussion voluntary residential green energy program. Um, I was going back to the video recording and um, I, I um, wrote down some quotes when Mr. Hennerschat introduced the presentation on the on the December 15th. He alluded to all the information, the good information, I guess, and I'm quoting all the information, the good information, I guess I should say that I have on this about a potential green energy option. And he based that on a memo from Tim from November 24th that Mr. Hennerschat himself had summarized in a memo from December 10th. Um, he also stated his parameters at that point, namely that a quote, any such program will have to be based on a real energy, not merely RECs or, or renewable, renewable energy credits. And B that no cost, no cost is being borne by any customer that are, that is not participant of the program. Um, at that point, he was reminded by the commission that they wanted that, that you wanted to focus on the RECs only, and Mr. Henderson Henderson did not really share the good information during the December meeting. So I was just curious. Any good information I think should not go to waste. So may I respectfully ask ask that he share that information with the public either tonight during the meeting or maybe in another appropriate form. Um, during the same meeting, during the discussion, Mr. Hennershot also shared that, according to an estimate from Energy New England, about 13% of our energy mix comes from in renewable sources, which was um, welcomed by the Commission with positive surprise. But with all due respect, 13% is not even half of the renewable share that Connecticut's Renewable Portfolio Standard is asking for which in 2021 is a total of 30.5%. I do understand that we are not bound by that standard, but I think it can't hurt either to follow as close as possible. And as, as I said before, 13% is not even halfway. So therefore, again, if there's any good information about possible increase, possibly increasing the share of renewable energy in our energy stack, may I respectfully ask that the PUC at least take a look at that information and maybe consider the reason Mr. Hennershot thought that a residential green energy program should include real green energy and not only Rex. Thank you. Yeah, I'm not prepared to offer any sort of an update on that. I'll, I'll acknowledge minimal, if any, progress on my part in advancing that issue. Um, with respect to the conversation about Rex versus real energy, the conversation that took place at that meeting was, for me at least, a clarifying one where I came away better understanding what the PUC 
wanted from the program. And I now better understand that recs are an acceptable means to accomplish it. Uh, earlier, I did not appreciate that. I, I was, it was my impression that the PUC wanted it based on real energy, not merely recs. And so um, that will be my focus going forward. And there was one other point. Um, I can't recall. I'm sorry. I've I've lost it. <laughs> yeah, that, I, I'm sorry. That was a long, was a long question. question. Um, so, Mr. Chairman, if I may, just sure. be, before the pub, yeah, I just look I, this 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 concept this concept of Rex versus real energy. Um, yeah. Again, I I was I believe I was speaking out of my league. When we talked about this in the first instance, the last time we met in person, that was September, October, I think. Um, you know, in, in my view, uh, I am a, a a real live energy person to the extent. Again, and I, I've got a little different view on on the percentage and whether thirteen percent is good. I think thirteen percent. I was pleasantly surprised, and I remain. Uh, happy at this juncture that we're, we we at least have 13% of renewable energy energy as part of our of our standard operating pr procedure purchases. I don't know if it's feasible, and I, I think I, this is what I said out of my league in, in the September October meeting. I, I don't know if it's feasible for us to increase that number to let's just say 30% based on purchasing renewable energy as it as it's generated i don't know if that's possible or not or if the only way we are going to increase is increase per pursuant to a rec program and again joel and mr chairman you probably could speak to this better than i but i am not one in favor to to in to move our renewable energy purchases up via recs based on my understanding that recs are just Essentially, we're just we're buying pieces of paper that are being sold on the market by those. And again, correct me if I'm wrong, by those who are producing green energy. It's not necessarily that that green energy is going to heat heat my house or heat other Connecticut Wallingford rate payers um, or light Wallingford rate payers homes. And, and I just want to make sure that that that's 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 what my understanding is. And I don't want to just, I don't want to be an advocate of, of working expeditiously to increase a, a number from 13 to 30 if that number is going to be increased by purchasing paper, which is what I understand it to be. Well, excuse me, Mr. Bernie, but there, there's, there's, there's now sort of two topics in front of us as a result of your comments. One is how to achieve the, vol the, the, the voluntary residential green energy program if the commission wishes to pursue one based on what i might prepare and bring forth and then a separate concept of the overall energy portfolio having more than just the 13 percent that happens to happen because that's sort of what the regional market is at this point and um you know, the commission has always made it clear to me that the cost of our service was paramount and that's best done by the traditional purchases through credit worthy county counterparties um to sort of a competitive bidding process via the regional market and not and and not throwing in the consideration of it needs to be so much renewable um and then the idea of rex to me at this point is merely a means by which to possibly structure and produce a voluntary program for individual customers i hope i hope those comments were helpful they were quite helpful to me rick thank you okay any other questions uh, from the public then um, if, I, if, yes. I, if I may, just to clarify, may, maybe I understood that wrong, but my impression was that Mr. Hendershot had information that would make um, making this voluntary residential green energy program feasible 
including real green energy. I, I know it's not a real green electron coming into my house. I, I'm aware. But but um, that would increase our demand or our share of, of green energy. And I just want to make sure if if that's the case, if he has good quotes, good information, I I just would like the commission to take a look at that and, and at least consider if that could be an option and not from the start on say, no, I'm not interested in that part, I'll focus on the rec. I think that's that's my main my main question. Well, I'll try to take a stab at that. I think the phrase you keep coming back to is when I said good information. What I was talking about was clarifying information from Energy New England. I, I don't know. Good might be in the eye of the beholder. I'd have to go back and revisit what I said. But my point at the time was I'd received a very, to me, informative and illustrative email from Energy New England. Um and that was the quote good information unquote that i referred to at the time um and to repeat what i said to mr bernie and to clarify for the record and to make sure you miss you understand me miss kopfer that i view now my instruct the preference of the commission to be that a vol a voluntary green energy program may very well be based merely on RECs Correct. just for the purposes of that program. And one other detail I, I didn't get a chance to repeat this evening because uh, it skipped my mind, and I remember it was another overarching criteria of this program needs to be that there are no costs generated that, that in any way, shape, or form are borne by any other customers. They're only borne by the participants of this program. Yeah, and if I may, I think you know I, I I I can echo that 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 certainly was my impression from the previous meeting that uh, that that seemed to be what the thought was with regard you know from all all three commissioners. If we start getting into green energy, it's almost guaranteed at this point that it's going to increase the prices to to everybody, and that really is not what we're about. What we're about is providing the lowest reasonable cost energy that is reliable and in doing so in a safe manner. Uh, if it gets to the point where the, and I've said this before, and this has been my opinion for years, if it gets to the point where, if you will, the green energy is competitive, I have had no problem whatsoever in having it. But keep in mind that if you're dealing with solar in this climate, you're only talking solar is probably only good for maybe 12, maybe 14 percent of the time. Wind, wind, you may get more than that. Wind doesn't always blow when you need it. So one of the biggest things that we have to consider always is the storage end of it. And when you know, if the storage is gets to the point where it is economically feasible, and you know, that then will help make both solar and wind far more competitive perhaps than they than they have been but it's, it's a combination of things and as i say the you know the program that has been discussed was with the idea of for providing a voluntary one similar to what was done several years ago uh, and the only way we can do that potentially without increasing prices to the other customers is by the utilization of rex and as I say, at some point it may be economically feasible to go ahead and get specific green energy. I have no problem with that, but I just don't want it to cost our customers more than what it needs to. That's just my personal opinion. I, I understand and appreciate that. I am a customer. I definitely benefit from low rates. Um, however, if I may go back, um, I think Mr. Reinbold earlier stated in, in connection with the peer station um, that the electricity prices have been going down and will probably continue to go down for the next few years or longer um, midterm, in part at least due to renewable energy um, coming in cheaper. So I, I have trouble understanding, on one hand you say, if we go, if, if we start getting into green energy, it will be more expensive, and on the other hand, we see 
that actually renewable energy keeps lowering electric rates or electric prices on the market. It's a very it, it, it's a very complex market with many many moving parts, and um, the Pierce plant, among other things, is essentially a capacity hedge that we mm -hmm. have, uh, and it's a matter of what we're willing to pay for a capacity hedge. Uh, there have been benefits of that for a number of years. We knew that you know I know roughly what it's kind of what it takes takes for capacity rates to go ahead and make it economically feasible for us. Uh, and at this point, that's only going to get worse over the next several years. That being said, we own the building. I say we, the town, owns the building. Uh, we are 32.85%, I believe, owners of the, of, of the Pierce generating portion. You know, the GE frame seven that's in there. Uh, it's a matter of whether we continue with that investment or not. The fact that it's in our building probably lends more weight to keeping it than it might otherwise. But uh, that's something we're going to have to take a look at as, as, as the year rolls on here. So, um, Mr. Chairman, per permission just to, to, to make sure that I understand something that was just said, uh, not regarding but regarding Pierce, but also this concept that the reason why energy prices are going down is because of an increase in green energy. That that's a thesis that I just heard. It is that I, if I heard that correctly, can somebody just make sh make sure the record is clear that 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 there is or is not a correlation to that? In the capacity market, Patrick, there may be. Uh, in the energy market, there would not be. Correct. Um, and with the capacity market, it's just, it's sheer volume. There's so many units bidding for a given amount of required capacity that mm -hmm. it's almost an oversupply. But the, but the projects still need the revenues they need to remain economically viable. And so the energy costs will be what they be because that's where they see most of their revenue coming from they recognize the low capacity costs that isn't going to pay all the needed revenue no. for the project and so the energy costs will then be what they will be. those are those are based on real operating pressures the capacity revenues are are purely a result of essentially supply and demand. Yeah, sure. okay. Thank you very much. At the risk of oversimplifying the market that Mr. Beaumont alluded to, they're complex with many moving parts. Okay, if there's nothing else then, I will close the public Q&A session and move on. And that will be moving to, since item, Excuse me, did we, excuse me, Mr. Chairman, did we have a vote on the, um, oh, yes, we did on the director's report. I see that now. I'm sorry. No, not a problem. Yes, I'm, 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 I'm keeping track of a set of uh, motions for Mrs. White, so okay. since we are re remote from each other. I have question it and make sure, you know, and say, yes, we did already, then to not vote on it. So I appreciate the question. Yep, uh, no, we're good. Move, Thank you. Okay, moving onward, then we'll move on. Uh, to item number seven, item number items number five and six have been removed from the agenda per the individual's request who had originally requested them. So, Neil, if you would, uh, you sent out an update earlier today with regard to the water pollution control facility. If you would be ha be kind enough to go through that, we would appreciate it. Certainly. So we will focus on the building and facility construction first at the secondary settling tanks the contractor continues to uh, move forward with excavation and sheeting for the two new additional secondary settling tanks um, moving forward and i revert i changed the order around this week so a little more logical flow order uh, literally literally and figuratively um, the secondary pump station 
So all of the lower level concrete walls have been poured and the contractor has begun installation of the 30 inch discharge piping. Uh, it's quite a, quite a sight. I was uh, actually in the lower level of the secondary pump station late last week. Mm -hmm. um, Neil, we can't it. hear you. I'm sure. unmuted on my, I, I'm unmuted on my side. I can hear you, Neil. I can hear you very well. Okay. Tony, can you now hear me? Tony, can you hear him? Tony? Right. You hear him? Tony, can you hear anybody? I hear somebody right, well, in, in the I can't hear anybody. Okay. okay. Well, I don't know what to tell you. <laughs> All right. Uh, we will move on to the Tertiary Phosphorus Building, or uh, TPB. At this point in the project, TPB just seems to roll off everyone's tongue associated with the project. Uh, the contractor continues to rub or finish uh, the concrete, uh, specifically the concrete beams for the roof structure. Installation of piping in the lower level of the TPB has begun, including the 36-inch influent pipe, the 30-inch bypass pipe, and the 42-inch effluent pipe. Um, and then uh, the contractor, C.H. Nickerson, has begun installation of the 14-inch plant water pipe uh, in the lower level of the TPB as well. Construction of the parapet wall at the roof level is ongoing, and uh, they have started to install slide gates and stop log frames at the influent box to the tertiary phosphorus building. So quite a bit going on uh, within the last 30 days in that building. Uh, UV disinfection post-duration building, um, so last month we commented that the contractor has moved the UV equipment inside the building in their wooden transport and storage boxes. They are now in the process of unpacking the equipment and installing it. An installation of the motor control center uh, for both the UV and the post aeration operations has begun as well. Uh, the emergency generator building, the roof the roofing trusses and deck are complete, and the masonry subcontractor is installing the brickwork uh, on top of the concrete block walls. And then the existing personnel electrical building, um, the contractor, AECOM, and our Wallingford Sewer Division staff are making final preparations for connecting the temporary standby generators uh, prior to removal of the existing standby generator. So we are required to have a standby generator power at all times. So we're gonna take out the permanent one, uh, use temporary ones because the emergency generator building is not up and running as well. There's been quite a few internal meetings as well regarding that. So switching to page two, uh, for those of you that received the handout, uh, original contract sum, $45,507,000. Net change orders to date uh, through the first 15 uh, months of construction. So net change orders, 105869.36. That represents 0.2326% at this time. So we are less than one quarter of 1%. And CH Nickerson through December 15, 2020, has billed 33.26%. So our contract sum to date is a little more than 45.6%. One two million dollars, and again, that is through December fifteenth, because that is the last payment application that we have received. 
and our construction contract schedule. There have been no change scheduled days, so it remains February 10, 2022. We have 13 months to go for the official contract completion date. Um, I did receive an email question from Mr. Reinbold, a uh, brief summary of uh, what is driving um, the less than one quarter of 1% net change orders to date. So we've had some credits and we've had some uh, debits. So uh, we did have a credit for changing to mechanically fastened rails. We had a credit um, for changing from cast iron to stainless steel gates. So together, oh, you're gonna, hold on. It's about $160,000 in credits. Um, so costs for change orders. Um, one of the common items that uh, we are seeing as well, currently through both approved change orders, as well as change orders that are currently in negotiation and discussion uh, between CH Nickerson and AECOM are um, structures that were left in place, essentially abandoned during the last upgrade in 1987 to 1989. Um, so we have run across those um, several structures at the secondary settling tank. Uh, there was an old pump station that needed to be removed. Um, and then we have some other ones coming up in a future change order. So removing that existing pump station was $35,000 and change. Uh, we needed to uh, purchase new uh, duplex basket strainers to meet American iron and steel regulations per DEEP. Uh, that was approximately 7,100. Um, one of the large driving aspects was to change to a 12 lamp UV system. That was nearly a $70,000 cost to the town, and that is uh, particularly uh, if we start to get an aluminum limit on that. So that was preemptive. Um, we have talked about this. If you remember the storm manhole to the west of the anaerobic basin, that was a constructability item. Uh, that was approximately $67,800. And then, um, Two of the, one other large line item has been to provide a temporary electrical uh, feed and conduit to both the anaerobic tank as well as the 56 rotating biological contactors. Uh, that is really a function of all that was going on in Main Street and phasing and our compressed uh, design and construction schedule. So, uh, so to date, the DEP has approved uh, six change orders, and so the net the net is the one zero five eight six nine. I don't know if you had any other uh, specific questions, and I'll so and just so for edification of the Public Utilities Commission as well as the public, um, you know, so all change orders start as a PCCOR prime uh, contractor change order request. Um, there are many emails and documentation that go back and forth between AECOM and CH Nickerson. So AECOM is our construction engineer firm, takes the lead on uh, negotiating and making sure everything is brought forward. It then goes to the Wallingford Sewer Division staff. We take a look at it. And if we have any questions, it um, goes back to CH Nickerson and AECOM for questions as well. So within AECOM, I would say there's probably six or eight people that are looking at every single change order that I know of, plus more behind the scenes. Um, certainly when it comes across, uh, I touch base with the AECOM project manager, the AECOM resident inspector, uh, Dan Sullivan and I discuss them. Um, I've even brought you know, one or two to Eric Kruger. So, you know, this is a ro very robust um, peer review process and it does take a long time. I mean, we are still
still negotiating change orders from, I would say, six months ago. You know, with a project like this with the schedule, you're dealing with what's in front of you, and sometimes the change orders take a back seat. So we do have some future debits coming up, and we do have some future credits coming up as well. Uh, so we certainly track the credits <laughs> pretty closely. Hmm. So that'll answer any questions that you may have. One quick comment, of course, you know, we did know that the change order on the UV was coming. You know, you know, we knew that that you know, we just didn't know what the quantity you know of, of that amount was going to be, Neil. But certainly increasing the number of units naturally was going to go ahead and increase it. And so that 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 we knew of. And that that's a significant size to that one. To a project of this size uh, to be this far along in it, we're what, about 40 percent, probably a little bit better than 40, 45 percent at this point, probably? Uh, so Nickerson has billed 33 percent. Their billings is a little over 15 million at this point. Yeah, they have billed that. Where are we? I mean, I'm sure we're, they're a little bit behind on the billing, I would assume. I'd say we're, I'd say we're high 30s, about 38 percent. Okay. I think 40 I mean, is a little be, aggressive. At this point, to see less than a quarter of 1% in change orders, I don't think is too bad, you know, at, you know, at this juncture. I, I realize it's going to go up. That's why, that's one reason we have contingency. You know, I mean, there is always going to be, there are always going to be things that are going to be missed. Uh, There's going to be th uh, things that, you know, surprises, such as the structures and, you know, that, you know, that we found. That we weren't anticipating, et cetera. Uh, that's that's just to, that's just the way construction goes. But uh, appreciate the report. Sure. Appreciate the question, Joel, with with regard to trying to get some grand, granularity around the change orders, et cetera. Uh, so, and I and so we do track the change orders and we put them into categories, including value engineering, which is credit. Mm -hmm existing site conditions about buried structures that we did not know were there. Yeah. You know, this is basically the third reincarnation of, of the wastewater treatment plant site. Yeah. And if you were, and Mr. Beaumont may remember, but my understanding based on historical knowledge is, is that the contractor for the 1987 to 1989 uh, upgrade, a really construction, uh, left a lot of money on the table. So if a structure, so if a structure could be left there and not taken out at their cost, it was basically a cost avoidance in 1987 to 1989. So particularly at the secondary settling tank, uh, we have run into a former um, pump station slash vault. Uh, we have run into steel sheeting, um, and then also a portion of a existing settling tank uh, from the 1950s where the secondary pump station is. So a big portion of our change orders signed and executed to date or upcoming are site conditions. Yeah, yeah and, and the thing is, the only way you, we would have known that they were even there is if we still had the you know the plans you know the the as built if you will from the uh, mid 50s and or we done all sorts of uh testing you know test borings gpr etc i mean you know, there's only so much you can do realistically when you go ahead particularly given the compressed time frame yes thank you mr chairman exactly to do this to go ahead and design it etc and so you know it is what it is, and uh, it does not surprise me that we found things. This is, a, you know, you're right. It's at least the third iteration. First iteration goes back to 1926, actually, I believe, 23, 26 time frame. And no, Patrick, I do, I wasn't there for that, <laughs> almost. But seriously, though, uh, no. Appreciate the report. Repeat. You know, are there any other questions, gentlemen? Hearing none, is there any other business to be brought before this body this evening? Hearing none, is there a motion to adjourn?
So moved, Mr. Chairman. Is there a second? Second. Okay, all those in favor of adjourning, please signify by saying aye. 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 Okay, one quick, thank you one and all. Tony, can you hear us at all? I would say the answer to that is no. Rick, would you do me a favor, please? Would you call Tony and let him know that the meeting is, you know, has been completed? Yeah, he had to move to his office. He's right next door. I'll go over and tell him. Okay. Well, I, as I say, if you would, because he doesn't seem. Well, to I think I'm going to go home and then I'm going to text him. Okay. <laughs> right. All right, folks. Take care. Have a good Thanks, morning. Everyone. Good night. Yes. Thank you, everybody. Take care.